again for staying up later. I'm Bob Costas. It's been 24 hours since we left off with Graham Nash, but believe it or not, 20 years since Woodstock. Graham Nash was a part of that, of course. Now, they're holding all the footage from Woodstock for a 20th anniversary film that's coming out this summer. So we can't show you the sweet Judy Blue Eyes performance from 1969. We can, though, to get you in the mood for another session with Graham Nash, show you CSNN from the early 80s with Sweet Judy Blue Eyes, the Stephen Stills classic. That song was one of several that you performed at Woodstock. Mm. 20 years ago, 1969, to what extent does any portion of what was romantically viewed as Woodstock Nation, to what extent does that still exist? I think it exists uh, a great deal. I think it exists in the spirit of people. You gotta remember all the people that were young and hip and cool then uh, have now become you know, TV announcers, TV directors, film producers, bankers. They have assimilated themselves into the system now and take some of that spirit with them and, and change their lives from the inside of the business now. But as much of that spirit as people might have hoped, remember that's during that whole Woodstock greening of America generation, and yet a lot of people our age, roughly our age, voted for George Bush. They voted for Ronald Reagan. That's a terrifying thought, isn't it? I didn't. <laughs> You're not an American citizen, though, right? Yes, I am. Oh, you are? Oh, yeah. I wanted, you know, many years ago, I figured out that if I was going to make comments about this country, about the, uh, the bad things that are going on here, and about the good things that are going on here, I'd, I felt a little hypocritical if I wasn't a part of the uh, place itself. And so I became an American citizen in 84, I think. What are your recollections of Woodstock, the whole scene that surrounded it? Rain, mud, marijuana, color, a lot of music, a lot of confusion, almost being killed in the helicopter getting in there, lots of fires, flying over a crowd uh, the size of which I'd never seen before in my life being somewhat scared, not because of the amount of people that were in front of us, but the uh, kind of people that were uh, backstage watching us. Because uh, we'd all been, you know, David and Stephen and I and Neil had all been in groups before, and we'd all handled lots of people before. So that wasn't uh, nerve-wracking as much as uh, the people that played at Woodstock wanting to see who this new band was. Because mm -hmm. you must remember, uh, the record had been number one for a couple of months, and no one had ever seen us live. And so people were trying to figure out who these guys were. You That's know. deja vu at this point? No, this was the first Crosby, Stills and Nash okay. record. Um, with Marrakesh Express mm -hmm. on it and uh, things like that. And so uh, being scrutinized by our peers was making us nervous. Recreate that scene. Some of the people that were there, Jimi Hendrix was there. Country Joe and the Fish were there. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of daunting for, as you say, for another musician to perform in front of it the is. top echelon of his or her peers. It is because uh, we knew that we were relatively new, although we'd, we'd done many years of making records before in the Hollies and the Buffalo Springfield and the Birds. But uh, this was something very strange and very special. When we first uh, came to New York to go out there to do it, um, the rumors were that there were 20,000 people going to turn up, and that was you know, a big deal, 20,000 people. And then daily, it changed until it ended up that people said there were going to be about half a million people there. And so something was happening. It was um, as if the thing had taken a life of its own, and the media were covering it in a way that they never normally covered a rock concert. You know, so it, it really was very special. Something was going on there at Woodstock that, was, uh, that uh, would turn into myth. Afterwards, Joni Mitchell wrote the song that pretty much was the anthem of Woodstock, but she yeah. wasn't there. No, she was sitting in a hotel in New York City. We were uh, uh, boyfriend and girlfriend at the time. And Elliot Roberts, who managed uh, CSN and Y and Joni, uh, made the decision with Joni that she was going to uh, have to stay in the city because she was going to do uh, the Dick Cavett show. And uh, it was a big deal at the time, uh, as you may remember. And so when half a million people were supposed to turn up, Elliot, smart as he is, obviously figured out that it would be murder to try and get out of there. And there was nothing that was going to interfere with Joni's uh, shot on the Dick Cavett show. So she didn't go. And uh, from the information that uh, we bombarded her with when we got back to the hotel, she had four of her best friends here just babbling about this 
this thing that had gone on, this event in their lives that was so important that she managed to uh, uh, be the great artist that she is and, and write Woodstock on uh, just the information front that she got from the media and from us. When two great artists are lovers and it's at a certain point in their life when they're both under intense public scrutiny and they're both in the midst of a creative burst, what are the pluses and minuses of that, that kind of liaison? The minuses are that uh, you can never get to the piano. Uh, <laughs> that's one thing. But once you get there, you're inspired. Oh, yeah, for sure. I wrote many, uh, many fine songs about that woman. She is one of the, uh, the most brilliant, uh, smartest women I know. She's a very... Uh, do you know her at all? No. She's a really wonderful person. Uh, the minuses, I think living under the public microscope living under the magnifying glass of uh, being in the public eye like we were, uh, it's very hard to be normal. It's very hard uh, to react normally to situations. And so things sometimes get a little out of hand. Uh, small things become magnified. You know, I remember a, a show in Copenhagen once with CSNY, and we were a little anti-establishment, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was our reputation at least. And Joni came up to me and Davey one night and she said, you know, you should not put down America so badly, you know? And we ended up in this argument and she poured a bowl of cornflakes and milk over my head and uh, in front of everybody. And if it wasn't so hysterical, you know, I, I, you know it, was, it was like I love Lucy in a way. But uh, she was a, a great, great, great lady. Rolling through the night here with Graham Nash. We talked about Joni Mitchell before, and we've talked about David Crosby. Now the three of you come together in, I guess, the classic love triangle at one point. I leave it to you. <laughs> oh, triad, yes. Crosby wrote the song. Um, yeah, it's true. Joni was, uh, was um, uh, David's girlfriend at one point. And uh, David told me that she was going to come see me in, uh, in Canada. And uh, we were playing a show in Toronto, I believe, in the mid-60s, late-60s. And there was this beautiful woman sitting in the uh, hotel room where there was a party being thrown by the local radio station for a Holly's concert. And she was sitting there in this kind of pale blue-gray dress uh, with a, what looked like a large Bible on her knee. And that was intriguing. So this... Uh, this woman uh, proved to be uh, a great friend and uh, uh, a, a fine person in my life. I'm very proud of the time that uh, we spent together, and uh, I have uh, David to thank for that. He was quoted as saying, look, I love both of them, so why should I be upset that they wound up loving each other? Yeah. But that's a pretty giving attitude. And it's, it's one thing to feel that intellectually. Everybody can understand that intellectually. Emotionally, most people couldn't get there. No, but you see, Crosby's a very special person. He meant it. He's an incredibly uh, uh, knowing person. He saved my life in many respects. When I was uh, upset with the Hollies, you know, that I was writing things like Lady of the Island and Marrakesh Express, and they didn't want to record them, you know. Crosby, uh, you know, w when that happens to you, I'm sure you would, you would understand, you begin to question your own uh, sanity. Well, maybe these songs aren't good. Maybe I'm just worthless. Maybe I'm, you know, and Crosby was there at the right moment saying, you know, don't think that way. These are good songs. Come over to America. I have someone that you should meet. And he saved my life in, in, in uh, many ways. In their own way, the Holly stuff, even though it was stuff that you eventually wanted to break away from, and understandably so, on its own terms, the Hollies were a good pop group. Yes, Bus indeed. Stop, Carousel, Carry Ann, those are good songs. Uh, good pop songs, yeah. But, you know, there's more to life than wham, bam, uh, in the back you, of man. the car, you know? There's more to life than that, and that's what I was searching for in the late 60s. When I was, uh, was smoking a lot of dope, they were drinking a lot of beer. And uh, what happens is that you become different people. You know, I was searching for deeper meaning. I was searching for forms of expression that would reach out to a much wider audience and mean more. You know, I'd done eight years of uh, pop songs like that, and pop songs, good pop songs, yes, absolutely. I'm very proud of the stuff that I did with the Hollies, or the majority of it. Uh, but there's more to life, and Crosby was one of the people that showed me that there was more to life. The Hollies were contemporaries of the Beatles, mm -hmm. and you personally knew the Beatles well. Well, um... 
well, well enough. Who, who knows anybody well? But yeah, we did hang out for a little. We, uh, we did play concerts together occasionally. They were uh, unbelievable people. They would walk into a room and the entire female population would just fall on the floor. And they hadn't done anything. When those guys walked into a room in their black leather overcoats, it was, uh, it was a special moment. You knew that uh, something very special was going on. And then, of course, when they played, uh, it was very obvious that these, these people were totally unique. I first saw them in, I think, 1959 at a uh, talent show that me and Alan Clark, who later uh, formed the Hollies with me, who were uh, they then? The Moon Dogs then? Or? Johnny and the Moon Dogs, yeah. yeah. Great people. What were they like in '59? Were, were the seeds of, of yes. what eventually became their popularity yeah, the already? The first sung? thing I ever saw them do was a Buddy Holly song called "Think It Over." Yeah. And uh, you knew, they were just uh, you, you just know. I think uh, it's very obvious if you keep your eyes open that greatness when it appears before you is obvious. I think, and in their case, it was very very true. When someone is a creative person. And you personally and the group that you've been involved with, groups you've been involved with, have a large portfolio. But when you take a look at a group like the Beatles, and they had a period of time of three or four years, five years, where incredible stuff seemed to flow from them almost at will. How does a fellow professional view that from the outside? I think you have to uh, view it uh, with a sense of humor. They're escape from Liverpool from the syndrome of doing what your father did and what his father did and what his father did before him and getting a go watching lying down and dying they uh, they escaped from that they helped a lot of other people escape from that I'm very sure that uh, the success of the Beatles is one of the reasons why the Hollies were successful uh, they opened a door a lot of people ran screaming through that door and uh, I'll be very grateful to them for the rest of my life they have no idea, of course, you know, or maybe they do, but they change life for many, many people. I got a look at an old Holly's video just the other day, and it's obvious that you fellas came up with an onstage configuration that exactly mirrored the Beatles. Um, I think that that was more than just us doing that. I think that was the people that were shooting it on television. I think it was the people that wanted to uh, emulate what, what was successful at the time. Yeah. We were a good band. The Hollies were pretty good. Back with Graham Nash, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young in their various combinations were a prototypical group of that period of time, the late 60s, early 70s. Your songs were anthems. I remember at Syracuse University, where I went to school, you could not walk across campus for a period of two or three years. You couldn't take a walk of more than five minutes without hearing one of your songs coming from some dormitory window or, or whatever. Were you fellas aware at that time of the niche that you would have within the history of that generation? I would say that we had somewhat of an inkling, yes. Um, we felt that the music was important. You know, now it's, you know, it's not Beethoven, it's not Mozart, you know, who knows how history will treat us. But at the time, we felt that we, as musicians, uh, were uh, tapping into something within ourselves that made it very obvious for people to understand that we were the same as them. When you were putting on the records in Syracuse University, listening to the songs that we recorded and wrote, I think it was very easy to identify with those songs and, and say, wow, I understand exactly what they're saying. I've been through that moment. Yeah, I feel the same way about Kent State. Yeah, Chicago was uh, you know, something that should never have happened. Yeah, I fell in love the same way. Mm -hmm. we, we wrote songs uh, from our uh, own experiences that obviously uh, people could totally relate to. Tell me about how Ohio came to being, because that really jumped out like that. It wasn't a long time in the making. It, uh, that was art happening now. We had a single, it was my song, Teach Your Children, uh, going up the charts, and uh, Kent State happened. And when uh, Neil, who was in uh, Pescadero in Northern California, a cabin I had in the woods with Crosby, saw uh, the footage on the news of the four students being uh, shot by the National Guard. And that one famous picture of the girl standing over yeah. the kid's body and just kind of gesturing toward the sky. Yeah, terrifying. A very sad moment, uh, especially because they were uh, protesting something, you know, that they had every right to protest given the right by the Constitution, you know. Um, Neil walks out into the woods, he comes back an hour later with uh, Ohio, 
He plays it for David. David called me on the phone. I was in Los Angeles with Stephen. He said that Neil had written this incredible song that we had to record. They came down the next day uh, because of who we were and our power, because of the amount of plasticware that we sold at the record company. We were able to book studio immediately. We walked in. We recorded Ohio. Uh, we figured out that we needed a B-side. Stephen had a song called Find the Cost of Freedom, which uh, seemed most appropriate. Ahmet Erdogan, who was then the president of Atlantic Records, uh, was at the session. We mixed it there. We uh, mixed the B-side. We gave him the tape, and it was out on the street in 10 days. Tin Soldiers and Nixon, Nixon coming. coming. How is the America you might have envisioned, that you thought you were part of changing in the late 60s, early 70s, how is it like what you thought would happen and you might have hoped for, and how is it not 20 years later? That's an interesting question. I think I realized after all this time that you cannot change things overnight, that uh, it takes a lot of work and a lot of energy from a lot of people to change the momentum of a nation. And it's happened. The American people did stop the Vietnam War. They did put pressure on the Congress and the administration to help stop that war. They did put a serious dent in the domestic nuclear power policy of this country in uh, the late 70s and early 80s. Um, they did uh, make it okay uh, to, uh, to be individual in this country. How is it not changing? It just never works fast enough for me. I just, I, you know, I'm 47 years old now and it's an important birthday for me. My father died at 46, so I spent my 46th year wondering whether I would make it to 47. It doesn't work fast enough for me. I don't feel as if I have enough time to accomplish everything that I'm trying to do in all forms of my life. All the famous rockers of that period of time are in their 40s or in their 50s, if they're still with us. And the question is frequently raised, can somebody keep rocking at that age, or, or does it reach a point where it's a contradiction? I think you need to talk to the Mills Brothers. I think you need to talk to Bing Crosby. I think you need to talk to, you know, people like that. I don't see any reason why, if the music is there, and there's great point to the music, why it can't be made, you know, forever. But their music was not so much about a sensibility didn't grow out of a set of circumstances as mm. much, to a certain extent it did, yeah. but as much as rock and roll did. Maybe not, maybe not. But I'll still be going until I, they put me in a coffin. I swear, I'll be knocking on the lid saying, I have one more song. What? Graham Nash has been so gracious and forthcoming, taking us through some of the history of the last quarter century in rock and roll. Let's talk about the future as we say so long. What's ahead for you? Oh, I'm making a record with David. I figure while we've got one in the top 20, we might as well uh, make another record. So that's going to come out soon. Uh, I'm going to spend the majority of this year um, concentrating on my own photography, of uh, maybe putting a book together, maybe putting a show together, working with my computer. What sort of subjects for your photography? Anything that uh, tickles my fancy. No particular, you know, thing, just something that makes me feel good. Young was added later, but when it was just Crosby, Stills, Nash, who decided and how did you decide in what order you went? I think that we were smart enough to put it in the order that it rolled off the tongue easily. If you try and put them in any other combination, it just doesn't work as well. It just doesn't. Graham, thank you very much. My it's pleasure, been a great Bob. pleasure. Thank you. See you later. Join us tomorrow night for Basketball Banter with Indiana's coach, Bobby Knight.